Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Herwig Gerlach, and in the following lecture, I will present uh, the most important pathophysiologic pathophysi mechanisms in the very early phase of sepsis. And here are my conflicts of interest in alphabetic order. And that this early phase is very important, it's, it's nothing new. Even Machiavelli already recognized that uh, the early phase is important because it's, uh, uh, infections are very difficult to recognize, but easy to treat. In the later phase, uh, but then it becomes very difficult to treat. So the early phase is already known to be the key issue by which management of sepsis has to be done. The International uh, Sepsis 3 guidelines uh, definitions said that sepsis is defined as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to, to infection. So host response in this early phase um, is important to understand um, because this is um, then um, inducing the organ dysfunction, which you see as a clinician afterwards. This host response is very complicated, and this definitely is only a very simplified uh, scheme by which uh, this uh, can be uh, demonstrated. So in the beginning, you have, uh, uh, you have so-called PAMs, molecular patterns from the pathogen, uh, which then uh, hits receptors like the toll-like receptors, TLR, and then you have the signal transduction within uh, the host response cell, which then finally is producing um, cytokines and other effector molecules. What these cytokines are inducing is different, uh, uh, several um, consequences, but a very important one is the inflammatory change of the vascular endothelium. We know this quite well in the uh, in phenomena of local inflammation. There are uh, several things happening in the vascular endothelium, which you see here um, as the light blue cells, um, when there is so-called endothelitis. If this is a focused local inflammation, um, then we know all the consequences of the four signs of uh, inflammation like rubor, tumor, color, and dolor, as Rudolf Virchow described uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. However, in sepsis, we do not uh, uh, always have a localized primary focus. We very often have a systemic bacteremia. And this means that this uh, uh, endothelitis uh, is happening throughout the whole body. And uh, whereas the consequences in the local inflammation are, are, are compartmentalized, uh, the systemic reaction um, is uh, over the whole body. Uh, tumor necrosis factor uh, is one of the main uh, molecules which is inducing this kind of endothelitis formerly known as uh, cachectin, and you may know that uh, for the discovery of this uh, mechanism, um, uh, Bruce Beutler and others received uh, the Nobel Prize uh, some years ago. And the key issue what uh, Kevin Tracy and Bruce Beutler found in 86 was the fact that these body-owned uh, factors like tumor necrosis factor are inducing um, with the endothelitis, the septic shock and all uh, consequences of organ dysfunction like hypotension, fever, DIC, lung, renal failure, or multi-organ failure. And one thing which is happening in, uh, at the cell is the activation of coagulation. There are several mechanisms which you can see here on the screen, very simplified again. So you have the procoagulatory mechanism, so the activation of thrombin formation. Um, you have the reduced anti coagulation by the, by the blockade of thrombomodulin, so you don't have enough activated protein C. And finally, um, you have the um, reduced plasma uh, uh, fibrinolysis because this, again, is blocked by, for instance, pi-1 molecule on the inflamed vascular endothelium. This induces fibrin formation on the cell surface, as you can see here on the scatter, uh, um, a scatter electron microscope picture, you see here the fibrin, uh, which is uh, created on the cell surface. Later on, these are clots. And we know 
from this year that especially in the COVID disease, this procoagulant mechanisms are utmost important for the cause of the disease, especially in the early phase. So um, uh, it was shown that there are several locations where this can happen, not only in the uh, microvasculature causing microthrombosis, but also causing uh, arterial thrombosis or venous thrombosis. And you probably know that there have been uh, several papers showing that especially the COVID-19 patients on the ICU have several, uh, uh, have very often very severe causes of these procoagulant uh, mechanisms. And um, here you see once again that by these SARS-CoV-2 uh, COV, uh, COV uh, virus, several mechanisms were induced. And this again is then inducing an endothelitis and the inflammatory thrombus within uh, this, uh, the microvasculature. And also you see again these, uh, these uh, mechanisms, activated coagulation, fibroanalytic suppression, are also platelet activation and basis of all the endothelial damage. There are other mechanism, <clears throat> mechanisms like um, cell adhesion, which is demonstrated here. The mechanisms are quite well known. And we have also the increased permeability of the vasculature uh, opening gap junctions um, in the endothelium. You see here an adhered leukocyte. Here is the base membrane. Here are uh, red blood cells. And these adhered leukocytes then are later on, if, there is, uh, if the gaps are opening, as you can see here, by a TNF-stimulated endothelial cell layer, then they are uh, wandering through these gaps into the, um, uh, into the tissue um, to fight against a, a, local inf uh, a local focus of infection, for instance. And finally, we have the vasodilation, which is induced by nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is produced continuously by the endothelium, <clears throat> but the production is increased after stimulation, for instance, by dendritic cells. And this finally then uh, causes vasodilation in the smooth mother cells and uh, the so-called vasoplegia in septic shock patients. And again, also for this discovery, uh, three uh, investigators received the Nobel Prize in 1998. There are several um, biological effects of nitric oxide, vasodilation, platelet imidition, neuronal transmission, but also bacteriocidic and static effects, immunomodulation and cell cycle regulation. And again, this also plays a role in uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And uh, here you see again that all these things which I just showed you, capillary leak, procoagulant things, hypofibrinolysis um, is very important shown. So you have this whole picture of endothelitis in uh, COVID-19 patients. And uh, the organ dysfunction is induced by thrombus formation, for instance, here in the lung capillaries or uh, which is then see as an uh, infiltration in the uh, in the thorax in the in the uh, uh, X-ray of the thorax, also in the kidney, for instance, here the capillaries in the kidney, which then induces acute renal failure, and the whole picture then <clears throat> can be divided in a pro-inflammatory response and an anti-inflammatory response. Um, very complicated uh, pattern of cytokines are involved. And uh, this is important for the pathogenesis, this immunologic dissonance. We have pro-inflammatory reaction with inflammation, organ damage, and shock. And we have anti-inflammatory responses with immunosuppression opening up the body for second hit infection. What shall we do against this? The so-called adjunctive therapy tries to interrupt this pathway. Starting, uh, and I just show you very briefly some approaches which have, uh, have, uh, which have been done in the last uh, 10 to 20 years. And I'll start up with the very early PAMS, which I showed you, for instance, with endotoxin. Several approaches have been performed, one, one of which is the specific intravenous uh, immunoglobulins against endotoxin. Here you see uh, a, a small uh, part of a Cochrane analysis, and you can see here that all over the studies, there have been no effect by reducing endotoxin or by blocking endotoxin with immunoglobulins. 
And the other approach is, is um, uh, the binding by hemoperfusion of endotoxin. Here, there are several trials. This is the most recent one from 2018. And there was about 150 patients in both in, in each group of this randomized trial. And all over now, there have been no effect, um, on no reduced mortality by uh, this endotoxin elimination by adsorption. The reasons cannot be, uh, it cannot be declared why this really happened. Maybe the cell needs the endotoxin as, uh, as dis by, to discover the pathogen. And if this is blocked, maybe then the uh, specific um, um, bactericidic effect is also blocked. We don't know. Another approach uh, was uh, the toll-like receptors. Also, there have been two large trials, one with, uh, with a blocking inhibitor, TAC242, um, which have been done uh, a few years ago. And this trial had to be stopped due to fertility. It didn't work. And the same holds true for a competitive inhibitor, Eritoran, uh, which is such uh, some kind of mimicking the endotoxin the lipid A fraction, and by this, uh, as a competitive emitter, blocks the TL TLR4 uh, receptor. And again, uh, this trial, the so-called excess trial, had to be stopped due to futility, no effect of this kind of treatment. The whole thing of signal transduction um, is another um, uh, target by which uh, therapies are done. And the most uh, known one, uh, as you all know, is the application of hydrocortisone, uh, which has a very broad um, uh, field of action within the cells uh, by blocking these signal transduction pathways if there's insufficient uh, response of the natural pathways by which um, uh, glucocorticoids are produced. Two large trials, very briefly. The one is the adrenal trial, which had no effect uh, in patients which are more or less in a stable septic shock. In an instable septic shock, it was shown by this uh, uh, simultaneously published paper that in these patients, this might be a positive action by uh, increasing survival if these are treated with uh, steroids. However, as you can see, not a real breakthrough uh, uh, study showing that this might be of effect. And finally, the cytokines and effector molecules. The nitric oxide is just one example because this is molecule is responsible for the septic shock for the vasodilation. And uh, it was tried to uh, block the synthesis of nitric oxide with, uh, with wrong arginine uh, molecules. And uh, this study by Lopez in 2004 had to be stopped because it showed an increased mortality, a significant increased mortality of those uh, patients um, which were treated. So this is the survival curve. And you see here, the treated group uh, had a lower survival compared with the uh, placebo group. And therefore the study had to be stopped. And very similar, there's another approach trying to scavenge uh, the nitric oxide out of the body by, uh, by uh, artificial hemoglobin. And this so-called Phoenix trials also had to be stopped for futility. And there was a trend also in this Phoenix trial for increased mortality by this treatment. So finally, are we still looking for the magic bullet? There have been so many trials with specific antibodies or uh, um, anti-cytokines or antagonists, and uh, all of them finally failed and were not uh, convincing. So maybe <clears throat> we are on the wrong road. Maybe everything has to be left as it is because blocking doesn't bring any advantage and sometimes it really brings disadvantage. Well, another idea is that maybe we are just too late. And uh, if we look for the real initial bacteremia, which then is inducing all this pathway, maybe to go somewhere within this pathway might be too late. And so um, there should the rationale of uh, new approaches um, is that we really 
cover this very early phase when we have the bacteremia before, or let's say parallel, when it starts to contact the host response cells to really um, uh, get an, an, um, a treatment in this very early phase against this bacteremia specifically. And uh, this will be shown in the following lecture by uh, Ming Shavler, which shows you some uh, options for the future and uh, some other options how this pathway may be interrupted in this very early phase of sepsis. Thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to respond to your questions in the following chat. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Lakmir Chavla and I'll be speaking today about sepsis and COVID-19 and the role for the SARF-100. First, an important disclosure, I am the chair of the Scientific Advisory Board for Xthera Medical. So <clears throat> I think this um, all starts for me with a little of a story. So I got involved with um, Xthera via a very peculiar um, project. So there was a DARPA project, and for those of you who don't know what DARPA is, DARPA stands for the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And they have a singular and enduring mission, which is to make pivotal investments and in breakthrough technologies for national security. This is a U.S. government agency that lives within the Department of Defense, and their main claim to fame is the development of the Internet. And they are sort of famous for <clears throat> taking on very unusual products that are very forward-looking. So in 2013, I was invited to join this program on behalf of Next Stage Medical, which was asked to perform the platform aspect of the program. And the program that DARPA was developing was based on a future scenario where they envisioned a pathogen that was untreatable, untreatable either due to resistance, to novelty, or a bioweapon. And they envisioned a virus or a bacteria um, that was something that had no current treatments, no vaccines immediately available, and they wanted to develop a device <clears throat> that worked like a dialysis machine, but instead of doing dialysis and performing hemofiltration or hemodialysis, actually was able to treat and remove bacteria, viruses, fungi, and toxins. So that was the program, that was the idea. Um, I remember at the time thinking, this is very science fiction and this will never happen. Um, obviously, they were a lot smarter than I was because um, they were actually imagining something like we're dealing with right now. <clears throat> and the way this program is set up, which makes it very different than the usual government agency, is it's set up like the Champions League uh, in football, and for the Americans listening, soccer. <clears throat> and what that basically means is that it's set up like a playoff. So all these different uh, companies come in, they have different devices and different ways that their device might achieve this goal of being able to, in an extracorporeal system, treat bacteremia, viremia, fungemia, etc. And then each of the different companies and their devices are given a series of tasks. And then the tasks are assigned, and then they all go back to their companies and their labs, and they come back three to four months later, and everyone shows their results. And the devices that don't do well get knocked out, <clears throat> and the devices that continue to do well get more government funding, <clears throat> more development potential, and they continue to move up into the playoff. And that is how I got exposed because the device that won this dialysis-like therapeutic program to remove bacteria, virus, fungi, and toxin is, you guessed it, the Seraph 100, which is made by Xterra Medical. And that was in 2013. And um, part and parcel of the work that the scientists at the company um, had done, also due to the work of the DARPA program, this device is now available in Europe. It is CE marked, and it's also approved for COVID in the U.S. under an emergency use authorization. <clears throat> so what is this device that essentially looked like Real Madrid with, you know, Ronaldo and just absolutely smoked all the competition? And it's really very interesting. It's essentially polyethylene beads that have endpoint attached heparin to it. And it turns out that immobilized heparin um, binds bacteria, viruses, fungi, and toxins in a very similar way to heparin sulfate does uh, in things in mammalian tissue, and I'll talk to you more about this. 
And so I think most of us think of heparin as the heparin we dose patients with to make someone anticoagulated. But heparin has a large series of other properties that make it quite ideal for this. And so basically, you can think of the device as a very large hemoperfusion system that exposes the blood to a very large surface area of heparin. So you're talking about 40 meters squared. Now, a similar size cartridge, if it was a dialysis filter, would offer something in the vicinity of 2 meters squared of surface area. And so <clears throat> it's really an enormous amount of heparin surface that's being provided that does this activity. And... You know, one of the more interesting program lessons of DARPA was, you know, you go into all these rounds of stuff and, you know, you have to create these models and tasks for the devices to go through. And so I was on the Battelle Next Stage side of this um, program, of this playoff, and so I wasn't really developing any of these products. I was more developing the hurdles and helping with the management of the platform and how it runs on a dialysis machine. And so there's a very well-characterized pig model where you give 10 to the 9th E. coli to it. You give it to the pig intravenously, and it's a great model because in three to four hours later, the pig is dead. And along the way, it gives you a really nice pattern of classic sepsis type of markers. You know, you have coagulopathy, fever, hypotension. And, you know, if you're a lab researcher, this is nice. You come in the morning, you whack the pig, you get it sick, you do all your experiments, you draw the blood, you give the treatments... And the pig is dead, and you know you're you're home in time for dinner, and that works great to do a very nice pig sepsis experiment. <clears throat> but this was not a good model for what we were trying to do because we were trying to take a, get a sepsis model where the animal gets sick, and then you have an opportunity to put it on a dialysis-like therapeutic, um, whether it be the Xterra or something else. And so we wanted the pig to look a lot like this pig model, but we didn't want it to get so sick and die so fast. So the guys at Patel said, this is really simple. We'll just dial it down and give the pig 10 to the 8th E. coli, and we'll just calibrate the amount of bacteria we get, and we'll get this very nice, uh, you know, dead pig septic model that goes for like 3 to 8 hours or 6 to 8 hours, which would be nicer. And you give 10 to the 8th to the pig and nothing happens. The pig doesn't get sick, it doesn't get a fever, none of its markers of uh, coagulation or um, immunity alter. So we were like, well, this is, doesn't make any sense. So we went back, we checked the E. coli to make sure it was the correct E. coli. It was, we played it out, and then we give 10 to the 9th E. coli, and the pig dies immediately. We give 10 to the 8th, nothing happens. And what we learned from this experiment is something which we tell people all the time, which is higher mammals tolerate bacteremia uh, quite well up to a certain point. Now, I'm not saying the critical threshold is 10 to the 8th versus 10 to the 9th, but in this pig experiment, it was. And what we learned along the way is that this capacity to manage bacteremia is not an immune response because there's no time for immune cells to deal with this massive load of bacteria. What we learned is that it has to do a lot with heparin, or in the case of a human, heparin sulfate, which is in your endothelial glycol calyx. And it turns out that heparin, and this has been shown uh, for a very long time, is very good. It draws in viruses, it binds bacteria, and there's all kinds of examples where heparin has this ability to bind up various um, um, microbial agents. And I think it's important to understand this, and if there's nothing else you've gleaned from this talk, I hope you remember this one thing, that soluble heparin and surface heparin are fundamentally different. So soluble heparin is heparin you inject into a patient who has a pulmonary embolus, and the PTT goes up, and they're anticoagulated, because that soluble heparin solubilizes in blood and interacts with the coagulation system. When heparin is a surface, it behaves very differently. It still has some very nice anticoagulant effects, but it doesn't dramatically activate antithrombin-3. And what it does is it actually provides this extraordinary surface that has various therapeutic effects against various infections. And the reason why we know this is because heparin sulfate 
is one of the largest constituents of the endothelial glycocalyx. So the endothelial glycocalyx is this inner lining on the endothelium. And what we find is that this gel-like complex that sits on the inside of vessels is not just there to keep things from clotting and, and soaking up microthrombi. What it also does, in addition to protecting endothelial cells, is it has these profound secular immunologic effects where it binds up viruses, bacteria, and other microorganisms. And what you see on the right here is this is heparin sulfate, and what is in your glycocalyx is largely heparan sulfate. Now, they're not identical, but as you can see, they are extremely similar. And when heparin is a surface, it behaves a lot more like heparan sulfate. And essentially, what this device is, and we learned this in the DARPA program, is the Seraph 100 is effectively endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. So look at all the things that it binds up. So it has extraordinary binding, and it binds MRSA, Klebsiella, E. coli, Streptomonia, Acetobacter, not Bacterobiomonas, Ratio Marchesan, Pseudomonas. The list is endless. It, it binds up viruses, Zika, adenovirus, endotoxin. It, it has this broad ability to soak up all of these things, which we recognize to be problematic in patients who have severe sepsis and septic shock. And it remar removes SARS-CoV-2, which obviously is part and parcel while I'm giving this talk. And so this surface that is heparin, not soluble heparin, but heparin the surface, also has adhesion of pro-inflammatory cytokines, but not in the same way that like a cytosorb does, where it takes off good cytokines and bad cytokines. Some of this also appears to be based on the fact of removing the putative agent. And so, you know, the effects of the endothelial glycocalyx and heparin sulfate are regulating vascular permeability, microvascular tone, it inhibits microvascular thrombosis, which I think is something which we're all very sensitive to with COVID, and it regulates leukocyte adhesion. So, you know, when I think about the management of sepsis and septic shock, there's sort of three large buckets of things that we do for these patients. So the first and foremost is source control, right? If they have dead tissue, we get rid of it. If they have an abscess, we put something into it and get all the pus out. So for a person in whom you cannot drain a pus pocket, if they have completely unregulated bacteremia or viremia, they're going to overwhelm the host. So the Seraf 100 allows you to remove pathogens from the bloodstream, which is a very nice effect. Additionally, it absorbs microthrombi, like the endothelial calyx does, and it helps maintain this um, antithrombotic type of environment and it also removes damps in certain PAMPs and impacts positively um, a procoagulant state. And these two impacts are part and parcel of why we see the decreases in pro-inflammatory cytokines in patients who receive the treatment. Um, and in some patients, because of the former two events, pathogen removal primarily, you also see improved hemodynamics and improved oxygenation. And importantly, the device does not remove antibiotics or antimicrobials. Specifically, it does not remove remdesivir. So I'm going to show you two uh, case reports where it's been published. Um, this is some really beautiful work done by Jan Kilstein. And basically, it's a woman that um, was admitted with bacteremia. She was a dialysis patient. And... Um, it sort of makes it easier to do an extracorporeal treatment when you already have an access. And what they did is they took this woman who had uh, gram-positive bacteremia and staph growing and decided to see what the seraph could do. Um, and this was not a patient who was, uh, you know, sort of in profound septic shock that was unmanageable. It was just someone who was bacteremic getting their antibiotics, and they wanted to see if they could impact the bacteremia. And so what you can see here is the Seraph setup, and they took samples pre and post filter, and they did it at five minutes, 120 minutes, and 240 minutes. And what you see is that in the first two samples, on the arterial side, the blood culture grows positive. But on the post filter side, it consistently grows negative, demonstrating that in a 
clinically relevant scenario of positivity of blood culture, the device works as advertised and can actively remove um, microorganisms. But I think that, you know, that's very cool and I think that's a beautiful case, but I think what most of us are dealing with and wanting to know the answer to is, does this have an effect on um, uh, COVID-19? And the answer is yes. So this is Steve Olson's group and Kevin Chung's group at Walter Reed Medical Center in Washington, D.C., which is a very large um, military hospital. This is where the president goes um, for his or her care. Um, and um, what they did is they took two patients who had uh, severe COVID. They were both in shock, and they both got serif treatments. And this is a 67-year-old man with non-insulin-dependent diabetes who was very sick and received two serif treatments here in yellow and over here. And, um, you know, all of you can access this paper. It's open access when you get a chance. But what you can see here is after the initiation of the treatment, there's this dramatic uh, impact on the norepinephrine dose. And you can see that the hemodynamics uh, improved throughout. And we also see that in this patient, they went from being viremic to non-viremic after two treatments, which um, I think is very important given that we now see around 50, 30 to 50 percent of patients with severe COVID are, are viremic. And the second patient is a 59 year old male, uh, very similar to treatments. And what you can see is this very dramatic decrease in norepinephrine dose, uh, improvement in blood pressure, and both these patients did well. And this patient also demonstrated a very nice um, decrease in IL-6 over um, the two treatments. Unfortunately, um, this patient, they were unable to get um, viremic levels. And since the, um, and these two cases are what led the FDA to granting the emergency use authorization, and I think it's important to understand that what we don't have are large randomized controlled data of the Xterra Seraph 100 in any large cohort of anything. And, and while DARPA may have been prescient in imagining the pandemic that we have, while they may have been prescient in helping to develop a device that was ready for it, the pandemic came about a year too soon. Um, had there been another year for um, some other clinical trials to have been running, I think the Seraph 100 would have been in a much better p position to show all the things they can remove in more clinical cohorts. Um, I mean, obviously, you don't plan for a pandemic that well. Um, well, I guess that's not true. Some countries have demonstrated they plan well for a pandemic. Um, we in the United States have clearly not planned well for the pandemic. Um, I, well, I think what is a more accurate thing to say is that we um, don't and didn't anticipate the pandemic in a way to have the clinical data we would love to be able to show you that's currently in development to demonstrate all the positive impacts it's had. So approximately 80 to 100 patients have now been treated uh, with the Seraf 100 in COVID-19. Um, as a consequence of this, we've gotten much more thoughtful about the right patient to treat and, and at what time point. And, um, and the short version of this is that Patients who are developing respiratory distress and just intubated or just prior to intubation appears to be the optimal entry point to offer them this treatment and improve outcomes. And there are lots of data that are in development that we'll be looking forward to publishing soon. Um, so in the interest of staying on time, I'll summarize by saying that the Seraf is a broad spectrum device for rapid treatment of bloodstream infections, including those caused by drug-resistant pathogens. Um, Reducing the pathogen load, particularly in patients for whom uh, reduction in blood levels of a pathogen, either due to resistance or novelty or lack of other therapeutics, may significantly improve outcomes. Um, the heparin surface that is on the Seraph device is profoundly antithrombogenic and has these very elegant antipathogen properties, and this emulates the endothelial glycocalyx, and I, I think that I think of this device as being endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. Um, and I, I think the most important take-home message is the Seraf is safe. It's well tolerated. I didn't have an opportunity with the allowed time to show you all the safety data, but this is an extremely safe treatment. 
Um, and uh, we are hopeful this is going to make an impact um, for uh, patients with COVID-19 and uh, later on with other pathogens. And with that, I will stop. First question, please enlighten regarding the antimicrobial stewardship. So I'm um, happy to take that question. Thank you for it. Um, so from an antimicrobial stewardship um, fashion, heparin is not functioning like an antibiotic here. So there's no issues of resistance. Um, think of it as a large sponge that is able to uh, remove pathogen. And I think the important question is, is in some patients, um, getting source control by getting blood levels of the organism down is what you're trying to accomplish. So um, Herwig may be more aware of this than I am, but um, given that it does not function like an antibiotic, there are no uh, issues uh, regarding uh, resistance. Oh, I absolutely agree. So this is this is a totally different kind of uh, of functioning, and um, so antibiotic stewardship in in the context of Seraph is probably not existing. Second question is directed towards Professor Gerlach. Do you uh, recommend fluid challenge for septic patients? Uh, yes, of course. No, so this is uh, this is one of the first thing you should do, at least within one to three hours. Um, the old uh, bundles said there should be a fixed uh, volume of something like thirty mL per kilogram. I don't think that this uh, has to be done. If there should be an online monitoring of the response. And um, well, let's say it's very simple. You give fluid as long as they have a positive effect. But then you should do this very early. And uh, it's also uh, concerning vasoconstrictors. There's a very new uh, paper uh, just, I guess, in this week showing in a, in a nice meta-analysis that also the application of noradrenaline to stabilize uh, the circulation in septic shock is better if you do it very early uh, um, than um, to wait until uh, you first give fluids. And this maybe is something like an error in, 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 uh, which was done a few years ago that due to the old uh, uh, SSC bundles, people were thinking they first should give fluid look if this works, and then afterwards, if it doesn't work, you give uh, norepinephrine. In my view, this is wrong. Of course, you have to do this parallel. We have to try to give as uh, as low uh, volume of uh, vasoconflictors as possible and as much fluid as you can uh, to provide stability. The next question is directed towards Professor Chala. What other devices were tested by DARPA? So there was many uh, other devices that were in the program. Many of them are not currently available. There were many manos uh, binding type uh, therapeutics. There was a company called Athlon that uses amaryllis, which is a flower. To, um, uh, the, uh, the basically the, uh, the roots of this uh, plant have mannose in them, and they can bind things. There are other advanced mannose-type binding lectins that were tested. There was also this incredibly cool artificial spleen where they used iron nanoparticles and attached them to pathogens as it came into the device, and then they used a magnet to pull out the pathogens. Um, it, was, it was actually very wild. There's nothing that is currently in the DARPA program that I have seen that is currently approved except for the Seraph. Um, but there are some very uh, advanced technologies and um, interesting technologies that are currently still under development that um, came from that program. Are there, uh, are there upcoming clinical trials for Seraph? 
Uh, I think uh, Herwig can yeah. take this one. He's more familiar yeah, with yeah, the ones I think in Europe, we, yeah. in Europe, we already started a randomized controlled study. Um, it's a study for uh, suspected uh, for severe sepsis with suspected bacteremia because, as I uh, as I told in my lecture, the the early uh, time point uh, in my view is very important, and. Uh, um, in this study, the protocol says we don't wait for the positive blood culture, but if we suspect that there is bacteremia and um, uh, we have an increased procalcitonin, which is another indicator that this might be a bacteremia, uh, we randomize these patients. It's, of course, it's an open label study, but it's an international multicenter uh, trial which just has started and, um, and uh, the first patient was already involved. And there's also a U.S. study that's underway called the Purify Trial that's being led by Kevin Chung out of Walter Reed that is looking at uh, the Seraph for uh, uh, a similar type of study, um, including COVID patients, but not exclusive to, um, which is an RCT. Um, I don't recall the Pacific Power Analysis, but I think it's set to enroll 200 patients. Next question is the serif effect bradykine storm. So it it if it does impact cytokine storm insofar as it removes the pathogen which is causing the cytokine release in the first place. It does remove some pro-inflammatory cytokines, um, but it appears to do this largely by removing the source. So I think if you could use an analogy, if cytokines are the smoke and the infection is the fire, uh, the seraph works by removing the fire, not by taking away the smoke. And I think that to the degree it removes the fire, the smoke goes down. And I think that's, in my view, a better approach. While I certainly think there is a role for dealing with high levels of cytokines, at the end of the day, if you don't get rid of the source of the high level of cytokines, you are largely uh, going to be unable to impact the disease outcome, in my view. Okay, I think we have time for one more question, and this is directed to Professor Chala. You mentioned seeing the filter as endothelial replacement. Could you please elaborate? Yes, just to be clear, it's endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. So if you think about what happens in a patient who becomes severely ill, the endothelial glycocalyx breaks down, you then start getting vascular leak, and that surface of the endothelium becomes profoundly procoagulant. That procoagulant endothelium ends up activating neutrophils, activating lymphocytes. It also becomes very procoagulant, and the ability to soak up microthrombi from the DIC that we typically see in sepsis becomes unabated. And what we think is happening, and we've seen this in, in many cases, and Jan Kilsen has a very beautiful case that is currently uh, under review, where in COVID, not only do you see an improvement in cytokines, not only do you see removal of the virus, you also see this big drop in D-dimer. And this is part of what the therapy does. So in my view, the endothelial glycocalyx has a very important function in homeostasis for the body. And by being able to put the seraph on for these patients, you restore that secular removal of pathogen and you create an environment where the coagulopathy can be managed, um, whereas the endothelium in the body is severely diminished and injured. And so, you know, we're looking for other biomarkers, things like syndicin 1 and uh, other types of constituents of endothelial glycocalyx to be able to demonstrate this. But what we consistently see is things that we didn't anticipate, improvement in coagulopathy, improvement in oxygenation, um, in addition to pathogen removal. And so um, part of what this device is teaching us, or at least teaching me, um, is what the body's endothelial glycocalyx does and the importance of these GAGs, these uh, glycoaminoglycans that exist in the glycocalyx um, and the importance of heparan uh, sulfate in the glycocalyx for which endpoint heparin emulates very well. Thank you. 
think this is all the time we have for questions. Thank you for both participating in the satellite meeting. Nice Any to see you, Erwin. Any messages? No, just want right. to say hello to my friend. <laughs> Looking forward to having real meetings in person. Uh, yes, definitely. So.